I was 10, 11, 12, I don't remember, in line for the movies. And my, there were two guys in line in front of us, like three or four people in front of us holding hands. And my mother pulled me to her, not my siblings, just me, and looked at my father and said, they're weird. Which just made me look at those guys and I went, oh, now I get it. I'm weird like they're weird. And, and I looked at them and I thought, they look happy, they look like they're in love. Um, I'll be fine. Inform brings you incredible stories. I left two days before the revolution. It killed me so hard. James has never experienced the taste of fruits that haven't been attacked by pesticides, just like he's never experienced a neighborhood that hasn't been attacked by bullets. Some things just go hand in hand. People say what's on their mind. I think that it is a, um, a cardinal sin to lie to the American people um, about war. Partisanship is a version of narcissism. In downtown San Francisco, the Commonwealth Clubs and Forum curates events that bring you face to face with the world's changemakers. One third of the wage gains that women have made since the 1960s were made as a result of the birth control pill. Twitter is a technology that I don't think we've seen before in this world. Since 1903, the most innovative leaders have come to the Commonwealth Club to share their vision. Sharing cars, sharing their homes, sharing, sharing a shared dream, a shareable American dream. That could work. You each can play a role in helping us chart a better future. Housing and health and education and policy all live close to the surface in us when our children are murdered. It's all the same story. We bring together the visionaries shaping the emerging trends in technology. It was a combination of instant and telegram. It was the idea that you could take a moment in time and you could capture it and you could just send it out and broadcast it with the entire world. I just threw the site together in about a week when I was at school. Oh, great. We've got angels, we've got incubators, we've got accelerators, we've got seed funds, we've got crowdfunding. We eat, we drink. <laughs> One of our first dates ever, we pickled like 100 pounds of herring and made 300 Definitely pounds of nerds. sauerkraut. Wow. Wow. Yay! Yay! We never shy away. 75% of the people of this country want universal health care and expect it. And damn it, let's go. Concentrated, deep, slow, loving, tender, passionate sex. Whether you want to be on the cusp of current events or feast on pop culture. I should have a great time writing. I should write a book that is as fun as any party I'd be skipping. Inform events are fun and action-packed. I have a sh an anthropology scarf that does that <laughs> twisty thing, so. Come feed your mind and soul and celebrate the future with Inform. I love San Francisco, and every time I come back here, I remember that this is the only city in America that has magic. Hey everyone, I'm Crystal Contreras and I'm the director of Inforum. Welcome to today's program, Finding Latinx with Paola Ramos. She will be in conversation with Code for America CEO, Amanda Renteria. If you'd like to ask either of our speakers a question during this program, you can do so in the chat or comment section of the live stream that you're watching. The Commonwealth Club has temporarily suspended in-person events, but we are dedicated to keeping you informed during this pandemic. We're going full speed ahead with the full slate of live online programming. Most of these conversations are currently free to the public, so we do ask that you consider donating to the club to help us continue our work. Please visit us at commonwealthclub.org slash online to learn more, and you can also text the word donate to 415-329-4231 live during this program. You can find this information and more in the description box below. Now. Please join me in welcoming Paula Ramos and Amanda Renteria to Inform. Thank you for that. Good evening, everyone. Um, welcome to today's virtual program with Inforum at the Commonwealth Club. I'm Amanda Renteria, the CEO of Code for America. And this evening, it's a pleasure to be in a conversation with Paula Ramos. Um, I know her as Pau. She is a yes. correspondent for Vice, the former uh, deputy director of Hispanic media for Hillary Clinton's 2016 presidential campaign, a friend, a mentor, a sister warrior, 
um, as we navigate the spaces we are in today. And so today what we're here to talk about is her new book, Finding Latinx or Latinx in Search of the Voices Redefining Latino Identity. Um, once again, if you would like to ask Pau a question, please ask it in the chat if you're watching on YouTube or in the comments if you're watching on Facebook. And so with that, um, let's get started. And thank you, Pau. I wish I can give you a hug. I know. Thank you for joining us today. I'm so happy to be here. Thank you. And, I, and I'm so happy that, that I get to be grilled by you. <laughs> so what's funny, and I'm not sure I ever even told you this, but um, my I knew you before I knew you because my uh -huh. first Audible book that keeps popping up anytime I <laughs> pull up Audible, the very first book that I actually downloaded was El Regalo de Tiempo, mm. um, de mis, mis hijos, which is your dad writing stories to his kids. And now fast forward and I get to be here with you, um, which is the discovery of you telling your story and your discovery to all of us. Um, wow. And what, um, what really stuck out for me at the very beginning, it all came rushing back when you were having this conversation with your abuelo about the word Latinx. Yeah. And so I thought that'd be a really good just start for all of us in mm -hmm. how, what that was, how you define it and how you frame it. Yeah. So, so I think the beginning is that there, there's a lot of rejection, as you know, with the word. No, there's a lot of pushback. And someone like my grandfather's who is a, you know, he's an 80 year old Cuban exile who's lived in Miami his whole life and has traditionally voted Republican. And so as I was writing this book and I, as I'm trying to discover what this word really means, he, you know, he's in conversation. He's like, why are you using that word all the time? No. And, and, and que significa? like, what, what the hell does it mean? And so, you know, I, I get, I give him my explanation, which is, and, and I'll say it now, no, which is to me, the X is simply a more inclusive way of referring to the 60 million Latinos of us. Right. And so, VX is for, for folks that look like you and I. It's for Afro-Latinos, Indigenous Latinos, Latino Muslims, and queer, trans, liberal, and conservative. No, it, it simply forces us to see who we are. And so I give my, gran my grandpa that spiel, but still I feel like the X, you know, is uncertain for people and they still reject it. But I think when, once you start putting a face to it, you know, when I'm like, Grandpa, like, I am Latinx. No, I am queer. I've never felt part of the community. Yo soy Latinx. Um, Fulana de tal is Latinx, she's Afro-Cuban, you know, she's as Cuban as you are, grandpa, like that, that is what it means to be Latinx, but then I tell him, I'm like, I'm like, dude, you, you actually are Latinx, and I'll tell you why, because in my eyes, my grandpa is someone that has constantly been reinventing himself in this country, right, he's constantly been pushing barriers, and even just this morning, he did it once again, right, he, this is someone that has been casted as a Republican Cuban, and today, suddenly I'm on Twitter yesterday and he was speaking against, um, you know, President Trump because he keeps using the word socialism and communism, not to make this political, but there he is once again, pushing boundaries and breaking stereotypes like that is Latinx. And so to this day, I'll tell him, I'm like, you embody that word. <laughs> um, there's something really beautiful, I think, um, whether it's uh, our community, um, whether it's first generation and trying to make sense of this world, we live so much by the stories our abuelo or our parents have taught us. And there's yeah. this really beautiful response back, like we're sharing to the new world that we're in um, the other way. Um, and exactly. so I found that throughout your book that was really beautiful and speaks to, I think, what so many people are on this journey with you um, throughout this book. Um, I have to say, I was very excited. Um, you know, I'm from the Central Valley of California. Yeah. So all you listeners, um, one of the things that's true about the Valley, and Bao, I'm sure you saw this when you were there, is oftentimes we sort of feel like we're left out in the Central Valley mm -hmm. of California. People go to LA, people go to San Francisco. Yeah. And then maybe they drive through or need gas somewhere in the, in the Central Valley. Yeah. What was, I was so excited about is your first chapter is on being in Fresno. Um, yeah. I'd love to hear how you came to that um, and why you picked Fresno first. Well, the, the, the Fresno comes into my mind even before, even before you and I met, no? Um, even before I started even thinking about Latinx, but it did, it did help me to start breaking my own stereotypes about us. One of my really good friends from grad school, 
um, is from Fresno. And I remember in conversations with her, um, you know, we were we were talking about a bunch of different things, and she 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 referred to this like meth epidemic um, that she herself had gone through um, because she had seen you know some of her loved ones succumb to, to to meth, and so that just got me thinking. I was like, wow, like I had no idea, right? And she's like, yeah, like it's it's a crisis and it's happening, and like meth is a problem, but like no no one really talks about it. No, people are sort of like just take it and 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 no nowhere in the national media do people talk about it. and so before I wrote this book I went I went to Fresno and I and I started like re reporting on this like uh, on 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 the meth crisis there and one of to me one of the most powerful things that someone told me that a, a user was you know I use meth in order to numb myself from the pain um, and this was a farm worker um, and that to me I was like wow know that there is there is there's so much beauty here, but there's also so much pain. And so that anyways, that that's that was like my first introduction to um to the Central Valley. And then one of the things that I wanted to do with the book is sort of like reshape our understanding of geography, right? So like people think of I don't want to just think of the Central Valley like through this like lens, right? I wanted to see the beauty in it as well. And so I was like, all right, where is the heartland of this country? Right? Why, why is it in the Midwest? Says whom? Right. And so I went to the Central Valley in order to sort of like break my own stereotypes and get myself and other people to understand that, like, hey, actually, the heartland of this country is in the Central Valley, because guess what? Most of the food and everything that keeps fueling us every day is most likely coming from the Central Valley. You know, that source of energy we get, the food we eat, is, there's a likely chance that that people there are giving it to us. And so that was kind of the exercise there. And I met amazing people among them, Bianca. Um, who was, you know, the, 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 the daughter of campesinos, of farm workers. And through her, I found like a thread in, in, all, of the, in all of the book, you know, which is how this young generation of Latinos um, that have sort of grown seeing their parents normalize pain or normalize injustices. In her case, she saw her parents, um, you know, walk into toxic environments every day with pesticides she didn't want any of that anymore, right? She didn't want it for herself or her kids or for her parents. And so through her, I sort of like saw that, saw that fight. Yeah. Um, yeah. There's nothing quite like being there. And um, that's partly yeah. what I fell in love with in the book is you could feel it. You, you saw things that for folks who grew up in these places, you noticed the way it smelled or the fact that people were like, I can't, I have to go outside. I can't keep them inside. Um, exactly. Those those kinds of realities. The other thing that that you point out quite a bit in this in this story is you are telling the Latinx story, and just like what you said right now, you call Chapter One the Heartland. But when anyone says that, they don't think of the Central Valley, even though it leads in crops, um, the diversity exactly. of crops more than any other um, more than any other region in the country. Mm -hmm. That makes me think about just in general that the Latino Latinx story, that we are such a big body. Um, you know, 60 million people, when you look at the kids coming into school in most of the big mm -hmm. cities, we are the majority. Um, why mm -hmm. is it or how do we rediscover a history and a narrative of America that recognizes Latinx people as central, not peripheral to the country's development? I think it starts by, by asking questions, honestly, and by listening, right? I think so much of, so much of the problem is that the story has already been written by people that aren't us. No, I think mainstream media has run with a story and posters run with a story. Businesses run with a story. And that story is sort of like antiquated. No, I think of the story as like the story of the older generation. I like when, when people think about us, they still think of us in like a very one dimensional lens and they think of us as a footnote. No, it's always at the end of the conversations. It's always the last question of the debate. It's always the last thing people typically think of in campaigns. Um, I think that is changing. I don't know how you feel about it. I think I think in this election, it is changing. I think it is clear that, again, we're, we're days away from the election, but I think it is clear that without us, you cannot win, right? That we're not just a Latino strategy, that we are a winning strategy, and that we are already voting in record numbers. And again, not to make it all political, but I think that tells you where we're headed. Um, but I do think a, a lot of that just starts with asking questions to the younger generations, right? Which is kind of what, what I try and do in the book is like, how have, how have we changed compared to our parents, no? And how have we evolved compared to them? And more than anything, what type of change do we want to see? And, and, and every single 
you know, every single story that I do, every single state that I go to, I always try and ask young people, young Latinos, like, when was the last time that someone asked you what change you wanted to see? Most people tell you never, right? And so I think it starts with, with that. I'm curious in those conversations um, with the younger generation, um, you know, some of this is about telling our story to a broader narrative. And I agree with you. I think part of the story after this election is that we got to know the Latino community in a real way. People are now talking about the difference in Florida versus Texas versus Arizona, right? We're beginning to understand. Yeah, finally, the (laughs) richness of who we are. Afro-Latinos, right? Like we're talking about those things. Yeah. Um, how much did you find when you were in these different places that people understood the broader Latino story themselves? Mexicanos in the Central Valley, you know, Cubans in Florida. How much did we or the young people that you were talking about understand themselves and their story or our broad story? And how did that play in their conversation with you? So much. That's the thing. Right. And that's why I always go back to this, like coming out analysis where like I what I find in the book is like, you know, so many people in the last four years, 10 years, we, we just haven't been paying attention, but we've all been coming out of our different shadows or identities. And we've been doing it with a lot of pride, perhaps so much more than, than what our parents were allowed to, right? And I found that in Florida um, with the Afro-Latinas there, you know, that, didn't, that weren't waiting for answers that were told at some point in their lives that they had to hide from the sun or alisarse el pelo, right? Or, um, and they're choosing not to, right? And, and they're owning their identity in ways that, you know, I don't think we really saw in, in 2016. And you see that in California, in the Central Valley, as I just said, with, with, with the children of farm workers. And I saw that with the trans community in Arizona. I see it here in, in New York City, where like, again, people aren't waiting for answers and they're stepping into their own identities with a lot more pride. And, you know, young Latinos left and right, breaking taboos, talking about mental health, Latinas talking about abortion, um, it, it's happening, right? And that's, that's, that's sort of the, the complexity of it all. Like we're all having these conversations, we're all sort of coming out. Um, and what do, you, what do you call that? No, what is that community? What's the name for that? And, and so that, that's, you know, to me, that, that's why I'm so obsessed with the word Latinx because I don't know what you call that, no? I don't see it in the word Latino. I don't see it in the word Hispanic. I see it in something else. Um, and, I, and even just like, if you look at the people that are running for Congress, um, it looks vastly different from the ones in 2018. Like suddenly you have like a queer Latina from California running, a, 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 a gay Afro Latino from New York City running. Like people are coming out in, in all senses of the word. Yeah, and it's, uh, I was laughing the other day when someone um, was giving uh, Senator Harris a, a bad time for dancing. And you're like, whoa, wait a second. Do you know, like, this is part of culture. And um, I think of course. it's a reminder that leadership matters and who's there and what they're doing matters and how it speaks to us. Yes, of course. Um, but I think the, the beauty is, and at least in the last four years, you know, people always ask, like, are the campaigns doing enough? You know, did Joe Biden do enough? Did, you know, is Trump doing enough? Whatever, we can get into that. And I think I think what we're seeing is like, no, again, like no one was waiting for answers, like people self organized, right? People inspired each other, Latinos inspired each other. And I think um, I think that's the story, you know, that people are coming out, not necessarily for a Joe Biden or a Trump, but for themselves. And I think that's that's vastly different. I think that's a different type of like vote and political expression and, and force. As you think about that, Paul, and, you know, we we're sitting in the, you know, four four years ago, sitting in. Uh, the headquarters, the campaign headquarters, uh, if you could speak to yourself then, like what, knowing what you know now, um, what would we have done differently? What would you have done differently now that you've gotten to know the community in a different way? And, and by the way, recognizing that um, we, you know, we as a Latino community weren't quite as leaning in as I think we are now today. Um, That's true. I mean, I think, I think we did, honestly, as, as much as we could. Um, I think, I, I mean, I don't remember walking into these battleground states and searching for these voices. No, I don't remember challenging myself. Um, I don't remember even, and I think that was a big mistake of mine, just for me personally, like, I don't remember taking the time to reflect on like, all right, like, 
here, here's what it means just for me. No, I'm one, I'm, I, again, I'm a light skinned Latina um, that is queer. What does that mean? And who else around the country may be feeling this way and, and having these like two different identities in one, right? And so I just, I just feel like if we could have been a little bit more like intentional in these states and look for those dual identities, those people that were navigating dual systems and people that felt in the closet here, but not there. Um, that's one thing. I think it's really, it's, it's easy to talk, you know, but I think one of the problems is that again, going back to like we, we campaigns and I think rightly so, no, you're scared to ask questions because you're scared to mess up. I wish we wouldn't have been so scared. You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. I wish we, we would have asked some of those questions and, and messed up because I think we're, we're allowed to mess up in order to learn. And, and I think there's a lot more listening than, than what, you know, campaigns typically do. Yep. On that note, as I think about now going forward four years from now, right? When I look around and go, God, there's so much work to do. Where are the Latino voices in the Federal Reserve? Where are the Latino voices in media? Where are Latino voices in just any kind of leadership? What is it? Do you, what do we need to do to harness the energy, the stories we're telling, the just the power in numbers, et cetera, to be able to be in bigger numbers, in representative numbers at these different tables? I mean, I, I think at the end of the day, it, it starts, it starts from the top, no? I think so, so much of it is like people at the top of these institutions need, need to understand that you can't keep moving forward without us, no? We always say the same thing. You can't keep moving forward. So you can't approach the future without us in the table because the future looks more like us. And then, you know, then, then. And so that I think is number one. Um, but then I also think it starts with us like reimagining a world in which we don't depend on people to tell us that we belong, no? And I think we're starting to see it. We're starting to see it in music where like people, people are creating music, not necessarily because they think it's gonna be like number one top song, but because they know that we have enough of an audience that it'll be successful, right? And same in, in writing, no, same. And, I, and I, I learned that a lot through the writing process. And I, and I had talked to an amazing writer, Ingrid Rojas, who basically said it herself. She was like, part of the writing process for me is like, I, I write, I, I close my eyes and I imagine an audience that I want, you no, know, <laughs> and I write for that audience. And from, from Ingrid, I, I, I think that was like an incredible lesson, which is completely true, no? You, you, we get to choose who our audience is. And I don't think we've ever given, allowed us the space to do that. Um, and, and I thought that was really powerful what she said. That's incredibly powerful. As you wrote the book, what audience were you writing to? Um, you know, I was, I was writing for, I was writing for us. Honestly, I was writing with the idea that I wanted, I wanted someone among this. I was writing with two audiences in mind. First, like the, the Latino that has felt left out at some point, right? That hadn't seen themselves in, in pages or in media. Um, I was writing with that in mind. I was writing with, with someone in mind that would pick it up and say like, you know, yeah, like I, I am my worthy, my, my story is worthy. Um, but I think also more than anything for like, you know, all these pollsters and, and politicians and people that think they know us um, and that claim to know us, and that talk about us in numbers, I'm like, just take, take a look, no? Have, have you ever been to Georgia and thought about Latinos? Probably not, no? When you think about us, what do you, what do you think? That image is, looks vastly different in the country. And also give it as a, like, as a manuscript of like, you know, you, you could win some votes. You could, you could win more consumers. You could win a little bit more if you look at us through a different lens. And so it was those two audiences. I was thinking about that as I was reading it, you know, and thinking about, you know, the pollsters and even the way like focus groups happen, right? We bring people into a room and we do it. We don't go to them, them right? We don't go That's to true. where folks are. And like, so as I was reading your book, I was like, you know, what are things I wish we would have had beforehand? And I was thinking your book, because that that's the depth of really understanding the people that we're talking with. And you can't do it in a focus group where, by the way, um, in a focus group, right? The facilitator drives the discussion. It's not right, the order. exactly. And but even thinking about that, like even thinking about who, who feels welcomed in a focus group, right? Just by the word 
the word invites people or turns them away. No, it, even 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 in the word Hispanic, you're automatically turning people away. Even in the word Latina, you're turning away like a lot of Afro Latinas that have always felt rejected. No, and the word Latinx, maybe maybe no, maybe that's that's true. But I I hope that the conversation takes us to to another place where where where, where everyone gets to feel included. But in that sense, like. I, I do think there is kind of this like identity crisis that we're all going through. We're like, we don't know what, what label to check. We don't know how to call ourselves. And that, that trans that's, you know, that can have bigger implications if, if we don't start like at least seeing eye to eye and like understanding who's, who's being left out. Yeah. I think that's interesting. Like I'm, I'm hearing in my own world, like the different discussions of what box do I check? And I think when I was younger, five, even five years ago, I'm not sure people were asking those same kind of questions. Like, oh, I want a new box. Um, there's a piece for me as I was reading this thinking how lucky we are in some ways at this moment of time in our country's history that we're actually talking about naming ourselves in a different way and defining what that means and then yeah. sending it out to the world to say, and by the way, we're coming in numbers, get mm -hmm. to know us. Yeah, right. that's uh, absolutely right, yeah. I, I love that. So on that, on the getting to know us, um, and I know this one was hard for you, um, the chairman of the Proud Boys, mm. um, when you went down to Miami, Enrique, uh, tell me a little bit about that, just because I think when we really think about the broad tent that we are, yeah, uh, I think you did something really, courageous and beautiful to sort of bring it together. And I'd love to hear a little bit more about what you went through on that. Yeah, so, so Enrique, no? so for context for, for everyone, Enrique, Enrique Tarrio is the, the chairman of the Proud Boys. And the name, perhaps you think he's just Latino, he's Afro-Latino, he's, he's Afro-Cuban. No? And so that in and of itself, when I first, when I first read his name and then I read Proud Boys, I was like, what? Hey, <laughs> like, how is that possible? Um, you know, and then you, you start digging in online and Enrique is, uh, you know, obsessed with Trump, the, you know, the Latinos for Trump person. He's the guy in Miami with the megaphone that is constantly disrupting everything. Like that's, that's Enrique. And when I approach him, when I go to Miami and I, and I approach a conversation with him, my gut was, was rejection. Like my gut was, and I remember walking into his house for the first time and I was like completely cold, very guarded. And I, I already like wrote him off completely. And we have our, you know, we had our first initial conversation, whatever, I interview him, we're not really getting along, we do it. But then I, I, I meet him again, because I wanted to sort of practice what I was preaching, right, which is this idea that Latinx embodies, which is break my own biases, right? because you're Latino doesn't mean that you can't be conservative, right? It doesn't mean that you can't perpetuate racism. It doesn't mean that you can't be an Afro-Cuban for Trump, right? That's exactly what Latinx means. You can be whatever you want. Um, and so as I'm talking to Enrique, I, I start to see that this is a person that has been failed by the system, right? That at some point he was sort of invisible and ignored that at some point, neither Republicans nor Democrats were ever knocking on his door, right? And I, I always think about like Miami and Little Havana, like we're always campaigning there. And no one, no one was ever knocking on Enrique's door because he really didn't fit in anywhere, right? And so that, that was sort of my first like reaction to him. The second one was that, and it's something that we keep seeing, I think in a lot of states, it's like growing number of Latino men that are you know, intrigued by Donald Trump I think part of that drive has a lot to do with the story of what it means to be Latino in this country, which is that, you know, many generations are forced to assimilate. You no, know, they are they are taught that, you know, being white is power and that being white is the American dream. That is that in every family, there's some form of that. And so some some Latinos want to forget that they are immigrants, that they are the other. You no, know, mm -hmm. And I think it's easier the, the more generations apart you are where like some people see the images of immigrants and they see that story. And if they can forget about that, they will. And when I asked Enrique, I was like, all right, I get it. But like, why, why Donald Trump? No, I understand if you want to be Republican, fine. But what, what about Trump do you like so much? And he was like, Porque habla calle? No, because he speaks, he, speaks like, he speaks like me. He speaks street talk, he told me. And so in that moment, you understand that like, 
for Enrique Tarrio to see himself at the same level of a, of, of, you know, powerful white man, that's all he wants. Yeah. I don't agree with it, but it comes from a form of pain, right? And so it was, it was an exercise of understanding that like he, he was failed by someone and, and that is driving him to, to ache for something that I don't understand. And, but at the end of the day, it's, it's belonging. Yeah, and it made me, um, as I was re- reading through that part, um, what stuck out for me is that you're right, he, he felt so failed by people and he gravitated to quote rights right? The constitution yes. that gave him certainty in a world where people let him down. And exactly um, right. that was when I sort of went like, oh, okay, I, I can understand that, right? There's something about all of us who've tried to figure out this system and this place and where we fit, you mm-hmm. land somewhere, right? Yes. And for him, it was the certainty of rights. Um, yeah. And I think in that case, is, and it's a phenomenon that we're seeing where the fear, you know, he's Cuban and the fear of socialism and communism is so deeply like ingrained in his mind, especially when like the president of the United States is telling you that, you know, soon you'll be, this country will be overrun by communists. And so that is, there's people that know exactly how to manipulate that trauma. I think Trump has done a pretty good job. And so, yeah, so they hold on to rights. Now they pinch themselves hard so they so they can remember that they're living in a free democracy, and, and sometimes sometimes that translates into Trumpism. Yeah, I, it was one of those conversations that I wish we had had in in you know four years ago. But I think we we will have more. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's a, a growing a, movement. That's right, um, and it really is sort of how do we bring that together? And by the way, what are the truths we need to make sure um, exactly. you know that are out there? So that certain things don't stick because they can stick. And then what, right? Exactly. Rights is a really interesting thing to hold yourself to. Yes. Um, and how we attach ourselves as Latinos or just as individuals to those kinds of things really make a difference. Yeah. Um, so uh, y- you tell a lot of stories across the book um, and just give, you give real context. Some of it is incredibly painful to read. And to know, and I can only imagine what it was like to be in it and be there, sitting with people um, in their spaces. What, when you think about the cross, the whole section of the book, um, mm-hmm. what are the hopeful moments that stick out to you in all these different conversations and all the different places that you've been? Um, one is the youth, as I said before, right? This like big drive that I saw everywhere of like rejecting normalizing pain I saw that in every in every in every single story and there was always an element of pain and yet every single voice that I interviewed every single story and there was a rejection of that and so like that gave me hope and I I personally learned a lot and continue to learn a lot uh, from trans women particularly trans and you know Carolina Lopez who who I met in in Arizona and who to this day I like she's you know a, a big role model for me I title I, I that chapter I titled Shining Light because through her you understand that you know and, and I think it's it, it speaks to the the heart of of Latinos right but through her you understand that you know many people are able to walk amidst crises because they see some form of light at the end of the tunnel right and you keep going through you keep going through and COVID is a perfect example you keep going through because some there's some light that like illuminates your path. People like Carolina don't walk without light. You no, know? and she was someone that came to this country because she couldn't be herself in, in a place like Latin America where um, it's almost a death sentence to be trans. She crosses the border, she goes to Arizona. She, she's only there for opportunities. Um, she's detained by ICE, is assaulted by ICE, comes out of detention center with no one around her to like wrap her around as a community. And yet Carolina keeps going, right? And she keeps going and she keeps going with like a smile in her face because of the faith and the resilience that she has and with no light at the end of the tunnel, no? She, she keeps going and, and, and that gives me a lot of hope in, because she sees hope, right? She knows she deserves better and she keeps going. And that I think speaks to a lot of the heart of who we are, no? That people have been telling us no a thousand times and particularly in the last four years, doesn't matter who you support politically, like you've been otherized, like you've been not wanted. Um, but we keep going, 
And that that gives me a lot of hope. And I think there's a lot to learn from from people like Carolina. Great. Um, as you were writing the book, what were the biggest obstacles that, that you faced throughout the entire process? I mean, so few. Um, we don't have enough writers in the community, not enough people telling the story and um, selling these kinds of stories in general. But I'm curious as to what were the biggest obstacles? I think I'd say the first one is to genuinely like gain people's trust and in a, in a genuine way. I think part of part of what makes this job hard and it's just a good exercise for myself is is making people feel like they're that like their stories are not being exploited, right? Mm-hmm. And I think that's important. And there's never like a guarantee, obviously. You know, you you do your job and I'm I try and do justice. And but I do feel like you just have to gain you can't just go in and out of these places. No, you have to truly gain people's trust. And I think I, I had to work for that in every state and every every state that I went to. And I found that a lot in the Central Valley, rightly so where I remember, you know, at the end, people would be, first of all, people would be like, why are you here? No, like, why are you even in the Central Valley, which just says a lot. And then like, sure, like, you'll come back. Like, yeah, right. No. And so again, you want to make sure that once this is out there, that it lives beyond these pages, no, and that people that it's, you don't forget about them. So I'd say, I'd say the the trust is, is, is important. It was important to, to gain access. Um, then I think just like, there's so much like I, I come out of this trip and I'm like, there, there's just I, I missed so much. Right. There's so many places that I didn't go to so many more stories, so many more nuances that I, I can't fit in. Um, and so how do you pick and choose? No, um, that was that was hard. Um, so, yeah, I'd say I'd say those those two things were were the hardest. And then, you know, just making sure that you're making people proud that when they read that when they read it, 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 it truly does justice to their words. I hope. <laughs> Have you run into any of them since? Um, I keep in touch with a lot of them. Um, I mean, COVID has, as I said, like my dream, my true dream was to like yeah. go back, go back to all of these cities. That's what I really wanted to do. I mean, hopefully, in, in perhaps in a post-COVID world, I get to do that. But my real, my real dream was to visit all of these places and like do, do these talks in person with them. Um, I'm gonna hold you to that in Fresno. You're coming back. Girl. Please do. Oh no, I'm. I'm honestly, I love. I love Fresno. Love Fresno for sure. I, and I'm not just saying it. I do. All I right. Love. So, let's update to today a little bit uh, before we get to audience questions. Um, today's world, the politics of today. Um, as you think about now, everyone that you talk to in terms of in sort of the voting world. Mm-hmm. Um, did, was those conversations even a discussion? Were there specific issues that you were hearing about as people were telling their stories? I mean, if you think back now, what would you have told them or what do you think the key issues that would have resonated as you traveled across talking to all these different communities? So I think the the issues, honestly, they're, I didn't think they're, they're not like rocket science to me, no? And it's, it's I think people, we people are pretty in tune with what they are, no? Um, it is, racial justice always comes up, no? Feeling equal, um, you know, healthcare always comes up, climate change comes up constantly in, in, in Florida and in the Central Valley, like environmental racism comes up. And so, you know, people always ask that question, like what, what, are, what are the issues that Latinas care about? And to me, what I found was more, not so much that, but like, the the a, a true genuine desire of feeling like you belong right and even among the young latinos 70 percent of young latinos are us like the 80 percent of young latinos are us born like this is like they're born in this country they are us citizens but that always kept coming up of like feeling otherized in their own within their own citizenship and so how do you resolve that i think it goes back to what we were talking about it comes it comes back to like making sure people feel like they're at the table you no know? Um, and I think that's that's a different strategy. You no, know? I think you you start from the beginning. You pull them in from the beginning. You ask the questions from the beginning of these campaigns. And I don't really think you solve that with a policy issue. And um, no. I don't think you solve that with immigration. And um, but you solve that by by tapping into that belonging by like embracing them from the start. Did you have any conversations? I'm, I'm so curious because I think in some ways, right, when Trump came down the escalator calling Mexicans rapists and criminals and had quite yeah. a bit of negative language about the Latinx community. Just a little um, bit, yeah. Just a little bit. Um, yeah. Did anyone talk about that 
um, the politics of that? Because when you wrote this book, we weren't where we are right now today. Um, was it a topic of conversation or really was it just arm's distance very removed? That was the undertone of, of everything. You no, know, when I say the feeling of belonging, I think that's been accentuated under Trump. I mean, you, yeah, you couldn't, you couldn't escape it. I remember being at the border right during zero tolerance. No, that was, that was a topic of conversation. I was there also again during El Paso. Um, obviously, Trump's words that inspire hate. That was a topic of conversation, and I had multiple conversations with young Latinas that had, you know, different levels of anxiety and depression. And um, they felt the Trump effect in their classrooms, right? Like multiple people had told me about the, the like being in a classroom and feeling, feeling like you were different, no? Or suddenly hearing an ice cream truck and thinking it was an ice um, car, no? And so, yeah, like, I think, I think the fear was extremely, it was extremely palpable. And also conversations with like, you know, high school students of my high school students, I'm not a teacher, high school friends of mine, if from Miami that, you know, had never felt otherized, had always, you know, walked around the country with a lot of privilege. And now, and now suddenly, you know, them too, you know, they too are experiencing some form of hate. And so, yeah, I don't, there is no escaping. And I think that's, that is kind of a big difference in this election, perhaps from the one you and I lived in 2016 is that like politics is deeply personal for everyone now. And you don't get to escape that. No, there is no putting that to a side. Yeah. And how do you think um, between now and then all the digital social media within the Latinx community, what do you think that has done to the conversations or misinformation, disinformation? Um, yeah, I'm curious. Both. I think it's made us extremely powerful. I mean, one of the things about COVID-19, I think it was like NBC Latino did a study and they found that the people that are online and on our phones more are Latinx folks like we're we're consuming digital content at higher rates than black and white folks um, and so that is power but it is also a threat no and people know that um, it's power because like a lot of Latinos are using our phones to organize they they, they use the form the we're using digital content to inform our families to educate each other but it's also how you see us being completely targeted by misinformation particularly in states like Florida and it's crazy. I mean, I've been there and the amount of times and I, I even received a text message three days ago saying that, you know, that soon this country would be in communist hands. And like, it's it's not a joke. You no, know, pe people, people know that you go on online and 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 they are being very, very intentionally targeted and because they know we're online, you no, know, because they know that this is an era of mistrust and suddenly everything becomes a credible source. And so in that environment, what would you say to folks who have your same role in Biden's campaign or as we're going into these final stages, what are the most important aspects we need to be doing? Um, and I almost want to say it in both ways, one, this election, but also afterwards, um, how do we continue this conversation with this growing new Latinx community? Um, I mean, in the era... In the era of misinformation, like, I mean, in six, in six days, five days, how, how, where are we right now? Two, one, Wednesday, like, I mean, there's five days, like all, all we can do right now is just like, just encourage people to be voting right now. No, like the election is right now. It's not in five days. Like it's, it's starting now. Um, and we're just, we, we should just be using our resources to tell people that. Um, I think beyond, you know, the story after November 3rd will become the story of like accountability. Right. And I think that's where, that's, that's where the, 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 if, if Biden does become president, um, that's where his legacy will begin. No, he's made so many promises to Latinos already. Um, he's told us that we matter. Um, whomever is in charge, whomever is the Latinx person inside needs, needs to know that the accountability starts January 20th. And like you, you that if a promise is broken um, that'll be that'll be really hurtful for a community that is putting so much confidence and trust um in in this in this administration to do good no and when really they don't have that much to trust in and no, not too much to be hopeful for in this particular moment um, and so again i think it goes back to like show 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 them that show them that they are worthy by allowing them to be at the table from day one no not at the end and also 
there can't be one person in charge of this. No, that's always like what we talk about. There has to be like many, 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 many people, right? Because we look very different and want different things. Um, and so you, we need to make sure that we're, we're tapping into all our different voices. Yeah. And I think one of the other things that's really happened over the course of time that I, I, I hope to see if there is a new administration that, um, or even in an old administration that I would hope to see is this coalition of communities of color coming together to yeah. redefine what the issues are of this country, right? Completely. Women of color coming together to redefine how yep. we think about, you know, about the issues that might face them as a collective body. And I think, I think though, I think that has come a long way and I'm hopeful to seeing what that might look like. Um, yeah. So before we get to audience questions, I, I'm wondering, cause folks know writing a book is really hard. Um, you go through moments that are clearly um, very heart wrenching in this, in this book, but I'm also worrying about the joy and the fun or the funny, um, just some of the lightness that happened while you were going on this journey, discovering you and discovering these communities. I mean, a lot. I mean, it, yeah, it, it's, it's a, it is a story about joy as well. Like I have amazing memories of being in Wisconsin with like, you know, amazing Latinx hip hop artists and being like, oh my God, like what is happening? Like there's this incredible rich music industry that is being driven by Latinos. I had no idea. I have incredible memories of like stepping into a classroom and seeing like a beautiful band of like young mariachi uh, players, no? And being like, again, right? When, you, when your mind goes to Wisconsin, you never think about that memories of you know stepping into Mexican restaurants in Illinois and just like not stop thinking about the story but just letting yourself get carried away by like like culture and food and, and music like that was amazing also a lot of memories of like I'm not a driver I had to drive so much for <laughs> a lot of this and like I was constantly scared so I learned how to drive which I'm proud of um, like <laughs> that was a big accomplishment of mine um, and then just like the the idea of like time, I feel like, I mean, you must feel the same way, no? You just, we're, all, we're always going and going, 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 no? You, you go from, from a campaign to a job and I never had time. It's, it's different to like be there and to say things on TV than it is to like come back home and like listen to these audio recordings and to these conversations and like take a second to, to write. Like I've never experienced that. And that was, that was amazing and to to like sit with it and try and, and make something of it and just that time was such a privilege and and then a, a good memory was also like in Miami when I when I talked again with my with my high school friends from Miami talking about the like Miami bubble that we all went through but that we didn't really know what it meant so it was really fun to like talk to my high school friends who had left Miami and then come back and be like oh my god like what was it like for you to leave Miami like did you realize that you were not like Miami is not normal? Cause right. Cause Miami <laughs> makes you think that like everyone is Latino, everyone is Cuban, but that's not real, but you need to leave Miami to get that. And now, you know, that was fun. That's awesome. I'm, I'm reminded of, um, you know, I, I think people do, uh, don't realize how many Latino communities there are, um, across the country. Right. And just the culture that can exist in Wisconsin or Iowa or Michigan. Um, and it was reminding me when I was in Iowa and I went to meatpacking plant and in the back, one of the mm -hmm. like, come over here. Let me show you over here. This is where the real party is. Right. And yes. It's in the middle of Iowa. Oh um, yeah. And so as I was reading your Wisconsin, I, I was just reminded that culture doesn't leave, even if That's you're right. in a place where it doesn't feel like it's everywhere and all around you. That's um, exactly right. And I yeah. enjoyed, I enjoyed that. Um, so now I want to I want to ask some questions from uh, the audience that is watching, and thank you for everyone who's out there putting in some questions. Um, I'm going to start with a question from Lynn. Tomorrow is Latina Equal Pay Day, and the pandemic is disproportionately affecting the Latinx populations. How can we highlight and address these long term inequities? I mean, yeah, like it's. I, I, at this moment, it starts with at least voting for someone that sees inequities. No, at least voting, voting for someone that understands that there is, you know, systemic racism in this country. There's two options. One doesn't see it. One does. Um, so I think it starts with that. And I, I do think this pandemic has has highlighted that and has exposed it. Right, the fact that there's more than forty thousand 
Latinas that have died from this virus, um, that's their, that's designed to be that way, no? Um, that it, and so the, the fact that they say that Latinos and undocumented folks are essential, but yet don't receive a stimulus check, again, like that is designed to be a certain way. And so right now, I think it starts with, it starts with voting for someone that at least sees the problem. And then it starts with pushing and pushing and pushing and being loud, loud, loud. And, you know, you, people may like or, or hate someone like Alexandria Ocasio Cortez, but she is, you know, she's pushing for that. She is loud and she is changing the discourse and the narrative. And there is a more Latinas that are running for office now than ever before. I think there's new opportunity to be having those conversations. And on that, Crystal says, um, I find myself wanting to idolize Latinas like AOC because I finally feel represented, but I can't imagine the pressure that puts on her and young public figures like her on a large scale. Um, you've been able to be in these spaces. You're someone that people look up to. How do you manage both of the, I'm pushing the envelope and how do I manage the pressure of, of being that voice too? No, I am not AOC. So that is, that. those are, no. We have all kinds of leaders and you are one of no, them. But I, you're out there, your voice is out there. So how, how do you manage that, right? I'll stick to AOC one second, just because okay. I think that tr the truly remarkable thing about her is that she is who she is in front of a camera and outside of a camera. No, she is who she is in her house and in Congress. And I do think, and I've experienced that myself, and I, you know, I don't know about you, Amanda, but like I, I have experienced, you know, when I, when I was sort of wearing different hats, I, I, I felt like it had to be a, a certain way in certain spaces, particularly in politics and in DC. And now I feel different. Like now, now I feel like I am, I am myself anywhere that I go. You no, know? mm -hmm. someone can tell me, comb your hair this way. No, don't say that. And put on more makeup. And don't be too aggressive. There was a moment in my life where I, I bought into that many times. Now I don't. And it feels, I, it feels very like free you know, to do that. But so I do some ways it's not, like AOC. So in some ways the pressure was more about, the, it's been a release of pressure of what you're supposed to do. Yes. And in fact, now it's kind of like, actually, if I'm leading the way by being just me or I'm giving a yes. role model of just being me, yeah. um, that's something different. And I think that's right. I think um, what we are seeing is AOC be AOC, right? You always hear like, let so-and-so be so-and-so when you hear about political leaders. And I think we are seeing that in real time. Um, yeah. And for you as a, you know, one of the questions that comes up is like, what made you want to be a journalist, right? I mean, you have a microphone, whether it's telling your story, someone else's story, whether you're on air, um, what made you want to be in that space? And why do you think that was important to be in that space? Um, well, first, I, I grew up around many journalists, like my dad's a journalist, my mom, my grandfather. So like, I that was sort of the world that I was in. Um, but I chose, I first chose politics. And, and the reason why I shifted was, I think after, after 2016, I asked myself, I'm like, where, where is power now? No, I believe for many years, I thought that power was in DC. And it was in to me, it was in Obama's hope and change. And I believed in that. And that's where I thought power and change was. Then I thought that change was in, in the Clinton campaign, right? And following that and, and seeing that legacy. And that's where I thought change was. Now I think it's outside of politics, right? I think I can be more powerful by asking questions from the outside than from the inside. Um, and journalism allows me to do that, right? Like journalism is a vehicle for me in this moment to create change from the outside. And my job is to tell these stories and, and ask questions. Um, and I do think there's a difference, right? Between I see someone like my dad and myself, like my dad has one lane. We talk about it all the time, no? He's always like, you, you have this flexibility and you're perhaps the younger generation has a flexibility of like, morphing no you go from one to the other because because we want to and because we know that we can no and so um yeah and maybe in 10 maybe in five years it'll be somewhere else but i just think like having an open mind about like where can you be more powerful like it's just an important exercise to to like think about it's interesting do you do you all critique you and your dad critique each other or give advice or hey i saw you do this my dad is the worst because he thinks <laughs> everything I do is amazing which is not true my mom is my mom is a good critic my mom my mom tells the truth my dad is like you know I can write like garbage and he'll be like it's beautiful, it's not so beautiful. 
or you know um but he he uh that's great I learned a lot from him of course I've learned a lot from him that's great and so one of the questions I get um we have here is you must be exhausted right now and I know you are because I know you're working like heck not only um getting this story out getting your book out which is important for all of us um to to read it know it get it um get to know our own community but uh, in these moments, in these last days of this election, I know you're on air as well. Um, what is getting you through? <laughs> <laughs> I'm asking. I'm asking for a friend. I'm not only asking. To <laughs> <in> the chat. <laughs> I I feel very hopeful. I think you're like it is. It is so dark out there, but it is also so incredible to watch, like how people are reacting, how people are voting, and I I'm very I'm very excited, like how how this becomes a moment in history. And I always think about like, what makes this different for, for Latinos, right? And I think I think of like 2008 with, with President Obama and it was like, there was a story, you know? And you, at the end of the day, you vote because you feel like you're part of a story. And I feel like we're, we're back in the same place. You know? People are voting because you feel like you're part of the story. And I feel that right now. And that, and like, it's a, it's a, it's a feeling that like keeps me going. You know? And so I wanna wake up and I wanna see what happens and like what, the, what that story is. I also want to sleep after, so like that's <laughs> exciting. <laughs> sleep a little bit after. The and light at the end of the tunnel is a is a bed. <laughs> maybe, probably not, because that that then then comes the hard part. Um, yeah. But no, I'm I'm excited about what that story can look like, and I, I think it's gonna be I think it's gonna be like a historic and, and a good one. Yeah, and I think there is Thanks. this coming together that feels. Um, you know, we talked about stronger together. I think we've actually been living what that actually yes. means over the last yes. four years. Yeah, um, absolutely. And it feels- I think it, it kind strong. of took this to, and I think about that all the time, no? I think it was a really good message. And sometimes I think like, you're right. Like the, the moment for that message was right now. Like we had to understand what stronger against whom. Unfortunately yeah. it took this, but um, but yeah. So th- here's a question that came up um, that, Um, advice for a young Latina who doesn't know how to talk to her parents about anti-blackness? I mean, I always, I always go back to, to showing real stories, right? To, to, to not talk about it in abstract terms and to show your parents who you're talking about. No, if you have black friends, if you have Afro Latino friends and make the stories about them, no, make it personal. There's a lot of, obviously, there's a lot of history. There's a lot of undoing. There's, there's a lot of getting our parents and our grandparents to understand, um, you know, our African descent and getting our parents to understand that like Latin America can mean many different things, but there's over 130 million, you know, people of, Af- of, of African descent in Latin America. And so like, there's a history to be told, but I always think in these is- instances, make the abstract concrete, you know, tell a story about someone that they may know and try and get them to understand, you know, just what it means to walk in a block and, and how that can mean two very different things. And I, I think that typically tends to work. Sometimes it doesn't, but. Yep. So this conversation that we've been having, right, we're essentially having it here in the United States of America. Um, but do you think that this kind of conversation regarding the Latinx identity needs to be continued, brought up in Latin American countries? Or is yeah, it? I- I don't, I don't, I honestly don't think it is. And that, that's a, that's a good pushback that I get all the time. Like, is Latinx very US centric? I think the word itself is right now. Like, I think the word itself tells a story of a US Latino, no? the coming of age of, of, of a Latinx person in the United States. I think there is so much opportunity to make it like cross continental. I've heard through these conversations, I've heard stories of people of like Latinos in Europe, right? Like, queer people in Europe that are using the word Latinx, right? And that are sort of inspired by these conversations. Um, I think in Latin America, they're using Latine, you no, know? they're using the E. And so I just think there's a lot to learn from why we're all using different words. What makes people feel better? Sometimes it's an E, perhaps it's an X. Um, and so, yeah, I think part, part, of, part of it is understanding, like, even just as we were talking about, like, after Latinos, right? Like, where does the erasure come from? The erasure starts at the south of the border. Um, and so, yeah, I'd be, I'd be interested in, in like digging more into that for sure. So maybe, maybe the next book is <laughs> a, global, a global book. Are you ready, Pao? Not yet. <laughs> you can take your dog with you. Oh yeah. <laughs> then yes. 
<laughs> then yes. Um, so one of the uh, another question that people want to are wondering about, particularly in this election cycle, is whether or not you have any worries. So where we're, people are talking about Arizona, Texas, right, heavy Latino populations, and whether um, you're worried about some of the antics um, that are particularly targeted towards Latinos, whether it'll work um, or what you expect out of it. I, especially in places like Texas and Arizona, I'm, I'm hopeful that it won't. And just because I think, when I think about Arizona, and I was just there last week or two weeks ago, and the, the strength and the energy of that young generation of Latinos that sort of saw their parents be criminalized by SB 1070 and people like Joe Arpaio, like that, that is outweighing, that's all the truth they need to know to, to go vote, right? These are a lot of people that are like turning of age and turning 18 for the first time that grew up in this like very anti-immigrant era, like that's new. That's a new phenomenon. That's a new sort of political power. Like just in Maricopa County alone, since 2018, there's more than 100,000 new Latinos that just turned 18 and they can vote. Like that's powerful. And so I don't think any misinformation can work with people that have experienced these type of truths. And so I'm, I'm, I'm hopeful, particularly in a place like, like Arizona, and in Texas, you experience the same way, no? No one forgets about El Paso, no matter how many lies you tell. And no one forgets about the insane COVID-19 death rates that you're seeing in a place like the, the Valley, right? You don't, you don't, no misinformation can like tackle that. And so I'm, I'm hopeful. Florida is a whole other beast. Florida is like, that, that I don't know. <laughs> I worry about that. Here's here's what I'll, I think I'll add to it is I think um, Please. as we, the Latinx community, you know, grows in power and understanding and the numbers and we start to vote, um, power is power. And that could become mm. scary. Um, and I think we need to be really well aware, like Fresno County, when they in California, when they started putting these fake official boxes up, it was in Fresno yeah. County, because where is the growing Latino population that is having more of a voice and pushing against the current leaders or the current vibe. When that mm. happens, I do think there are incentives and power structures that get very nervous and worried. Um, and so I think yeah. staying vigilant on us all making sure that we're taking care of each other as we grow and come into view. Um, I think that comes with that is people begin, and I know Pao, you get, I'm sure, hate mail in the same way that I did when we were on the campaign or as your tweet following goes up or your last name is Ramos or Renteria, that certainly happens. And so yeah. um, I think some of that is part of the territory and um, being aware that that's still, that is true as we come into view more and more. Um, so I wanna, I, I know we have a couple more minutes um, before we get to our final, our final big question for you. But I'd like to hear a little bit right now, a lot of our communities are particularly affected by COVID-19. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's always good um, to really talk about what we should be telling our communities right now, our families right now, um, in light of what people are going through and the disinformation out there, but just thoughts that you have about um, how we should be following this and taking care of each other. I mean, you know, one of one of the the saddest things, I, not saddest, but like something that really struck me when I was in the valley, like two to two three weeks ago, someone someone told me that they really think that this virus is truly impacting like our culture in a way that is that can be pretty historic. No, why? Because the way that we love is amongst ourselves. No, that is that is a very like unique thing of us. No, we we find community and safe space, and we've done that for decades and and, and generations. In, in community, you know, that is how we thrive. And so for, for that to suddenly break, right, for your, for, your biggest, um, for your biggest weapon in life to become your biggest weapon for death, like that, that is hard, no? Um, and so that, I just, I just wanna put that out there, that it is, it goes beyond the numbers and the death tolls, no? That it's, it's, it truly is, like we're going through something that is, that is very deep. Um, I mean, all, all I can say is like, is, 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 truly try and try and avoid that no like take take care of yourselves if you're young educate your parents if they're if they're cynical about the news if they if they've been receiving which they have different levels of information from the president and then your governor and then your your local representatives like 
you know, you, you know the truth. No, you know that you, you wear a mask, you social distance, um, and you try and isolate yourself as much as you can um, until, we, until we know otherwise. As hard as it is, like it truly is, is it is a matter of survival for a lot of families. Um, and I wish I could be more optimistic right now, but I think we truly have to ground ourselves in like how grave this is in order to, to bounce back. But yeah, I think it's, it's up to young people to like. Yeah. I keep telling my mom and dad, right? Cause my dad, you know, anytime you walk in, well, give him a hug, Mika, right? You know, See. you know, the same kind of thing, right? That's what we do. And um, as I think about it, I keep trying to say, we're going to be, maybe we'll be more of that when this is over. Maybe we'll understand yes. how big and important that was, you know, that was for us in a way that maybe we didn't appreciate enough, right? Instead of rolling, yeah. my kids roll my eyes when I say, no, 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 you go give them a hug. Mama say it, right? Yeah. And, uh, and maybe I'm going to use that. That's good. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, but we all got to get there. I think the other yes. thing for me in this COVID time is it has, um, it has really surfaced this idea of systems that are unequal, inequitable systems. Of course. Of course. And let's not forget that as we start to um, recover, ojalá soon. Um, so we're gonna, we're at our, our last question and it is an informed tradition to ask all of our speakers, um, what is your 60 second idea to change the world? <laughs> hey. My 60 second idea to change the world. Um, that's hard. That's so hard. I mean, honestly, just like the, the 60 seconds, a, a 60 seconds of Bad Bunny can't go wrong. <laughs> they can't go wrong. We need, we need joy right now. Like we can't make decisions angry. We can't step out of our homes angry. 60 seconds of Yo Perreo Sola. <laughs> Not bad. And so <laughs> there's a lot to learn about, about Latinx identity through Bad Bunny, but those lyrics and that beat can, can go a long way. So I'll say, I'll say, I'll stick to my Bad Bunny. That's awesome. My um, eight year old right now, I, you just like won her over. <laughs> yeah, good. It brings you joy. We need to smile. There you go. We don't know the effects. Yeah. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you to Paola Ramos for joining us today at Inforum at the Commonwealth Club. Um, we'd like to remind our audience that Paolo's new book, Binding Latinx. Now, hold on a second. Latinx, Latinx. Cuál However is you want. I do digo Latinx, but it is it is a word for, you know. There you go. As long as you, you get, my dad says Latinx, Latinx, <laughs> whatever. So however you want to say it. So Finding Latinx is available now at your preferred bookstore. If you'd like to watch more virtual programs or support the Commonwealth Club efforts in making virtual program, please visit the commonwealthclub.org slash online. I'm Amanda Renteria. I'm really happy to have been with Pau today. Um, thank you and everyone, please stay safe. Thank you so much, Amanda. And thank you for all of you for, for listening. It means a lot.